Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined, where we are reimagining vet life, and a great example of that is my guest, Dr. Bob Murtaugh, who recently retired from clinical practice after decades of giving back to the profession. He has had many roles in vet med, including professor, chief of staff, and very importantly, mentor. And his desire to give back only continues as he is currently running for president-elect of our very own AVMA. And last week, we talked quite a bit about AVMA and the Veterinary Leadership Conference with Dr. Gary Marshall, which was a really interesting conversation, so definitely go back and listen to that episode after this one. But with Dr. Bob, we talk about being involved in veterinary organizations, urging people in vet med to engage in discussions to find best solutions, and Dr. Bob's perspective on the current state of the veterinary profession. We talked about some ideas that I hadn't really stopped to think about. I really enjoyed talking to Dr. Bob, and make sure to stay till the end because I'll give a sneak peek into next week's episode onto the conversation. When did you first know that you wanted to go into veterinary medicine? Yeah, I think it was a formative period of time in high school. I, my dad was a physician, so I think I, I had an orientation towards the medical aspect and biology and science growing up, and I was intrigued by that. But I went to work for a veterinarian as a, a kennel boy uh, when I was 15 years old and kind of saw that as the opportunity for a journey that would meld what I was in love with, which is you know, people and pets uh, right from the get-go, so. Excellent. So what was the vet school experience like for you, getting into vet school? It was good. I actually was a fortunate one. I went to the University of Minnesota, and at the time that I was admitted, they actually took people after two years of undergraduate. And so I was actually admitted to vet school after only two years of undergraduate work in college and got a a bachelor's degree after two years of vet school and uh, graduated when I was only 23 years old. So feel fortunate that I, although I missed out on a lot of good college opportunities and probably a few frat parties, you know, fast track worked for me. So (laughs) now when you went into vet school, did you have an idea of how you wanted to practice? Did that change at all? You know, I, I don't recall that I had a preconceived idea. I mean, I grew up in Minnesota, so I had an exposure to relatives with farms and the agricultural piece along with the small animal side. I think I was always sort of oriented towards companion animals. And I think some of the mentors that I had during vet school uh, on the clinical side kind of pushed me towards the internal medicine aspect and specialization, which uh, I think when I graduated, that was the direction I wanted to go and and what I pursued from that point forward, you know. Yeah. So you graduated from vet school really young, and then you went on to continue that education into your residency as you were talking about. So you you went somewhere else for your residency, correct? Yeah, I I did a year's internship in in Los Angeles in in a private practice, kind of an interesting story. It was West LA Veterinary Medical Group, which became BCA West LA a few years later. So sort of an interesting twist there, but went to Ohio State, the Ohio State for my medicine residency. And then from that point on, joined the faculty at Tufts University for for 15 years and, and had a number of roles there as well as practicing specialists helped to create the emergency and critical care specialty college the group of other like-minded faculty from other veterinary schools during that time so it was a an exciting period in my career as well excellent so you spent a lot of time in an academic setting what have you experienced with being in academia so long well for me it was a A good journey. I think, you know, I I rose to full professor. I I had a, I like teaching. I like mentoring. I trained a number of residents and those people have gone on to be leaders uh, in the profession. So there's a lot of satisfaction, I think, that's come with my academic career. I was there for 15 years and and at the time that I left Tufts, uh, you know, it was 
I sort of had accomplished everything that I felt I could in academia and was looking for, you know, the next challenge. So it was an opportunity to to turn the page and try something different. Yeah. So what was that page? What were you kind of looking for? Well, a, a change in geography. So we moved the uh, <laughs> family across country to Portland, Oregon, and I was chief of staff at the Dove Lewis Emergency Animal Hospital for a few years and helped them sort of continue to grow. Certainly can't take credit for what their reputation is today, but maybe helped to spark that a little bit back in the day. And so the nonprofit aspect and some of the community service features of that program were appealing to me as well as to help them kind of become a training center in a small way as well. So it was a, a good part of the journey. So I remember Dove Lewis when I did my rotating internship many years ago. Um, <laughs> the clinic where I worked, which was also a private referral practice in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they had a subscription with Dove Lewis because Dove Lewis had their like videos and different training modules. This was like before it was cool and everybody was doing it. So I still remember Dove Lewis from that. And they it really did help me get through my internship. So I don't know if you had any part of those, but thank you. <laughs> no, I, I on the floor at Dove came after my time there. But I think again, hopefully I set the the foundation for some of those things to evolve. So it, it you know it certainly has been a I think an icon in veterinary emergency space and, and I'm proud to have been a little bit of a part of that, you know. So Absolutely. Well, I, I'm also curious because I have heard that you are, are a very lucky man. You you married very well. You have a, a powerhouse of a wife. And is she a veterinarian too, right? Yeah. It's Dr. Jill Clark, uh, who is an o a different o OSU, o Oklahoma <laughs> State grad. And she and I had the good fortune of meeting uh, when we both worked for uh, VCA. And she's a strong entrepreneur. She has an internet learning company. She's an accomplished equestrian. She has nine world championships with quarter horses. So, yeah, I'm second fiddle to, to, <laughs> to Bill, no question about it. It'd be so, you know. Yes. I love to talk with veterinarians because a lot of veterinarians are married to other veterinarians. So, do you have any? tips for others who might also marry veterinarians? Well, that's a good question. I think, <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's important to build a life together that's separate from the profession and to find commonality in, in other ways and, and to maybe leave the work at work sometimes. And you know, I think that's hard to do when when doctors are working in the same hospital and we're fortunate enough to have had sort of two different career tracks. So we haven't been in the same facility at the same time. And, and uh, that's been, I think, helpful. So I would encourage people to to think in, in that context a little bit. But I think find somebody you love and make it happen, you know, whether they're a veterinarian or not. You know, it's it's important to find the right person and to work at the relationship regardless, you know. Very good advice. Now, you've also been very involved with different organizations around veterinary medicine. How did you decide to start getting involved so much with, with different organizations? Well, I mean, the profession has been good to me. I mean, I've, I've made a great livelihood. I've, I've done what I've loved to do for, for over 40 years, and I'm the kind of guy that likes to give back. My leadership style is sort of one as a servant leader. So if I can find ways to help the profession or help individuals within the profession, those are the things that give me satisfaction, both personally and professionally. So. And what have been some of the things that you've learned working with different organizations? Because I'm sure, I mean, you're you're involved with multiple and different types. and I think we need to spread more awareness about getting involved in these types of 
are organized uh, veterinary groups. So what are some of the things that you would would recommend to veterinarians and veterinary technicians about getting involved? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we all need support. And, you know, I think you, you, you get when you give. And so I, I think being involved either locally or regionally or nationally uh, can be not only helpful to uh, the organization, but also I think it helps individuals uh, network, uh, creates friendships and relationships that can be supportive in times of stress. And it also gives opportunity for for personal growth, you know, whether it's in the workplace, the hospital every day, or organized veterinary activity, it's, you know, working on those skill sets that help you be a better communicator, a better collaborator, a more empathetic person, somebody who's curious and sees things from all directions. For me, it's been opportunities to interact with people that have become mentors or coaches for me that I would have never met if I hadn't been involved in some of those activities. So it's hard work and it's an <laughs> app and it's a volunteer event more often than not. But, uh, you know, again, I, I would come back to the fact that if you give of yourself, generally you're going to get more out of it than what you spent, so to speak. Mm. I think a lot of it too, just talking with some others who have, you know, gone to even their state ABMA and tried to participate there, there there's an a certain awareness that you gain also for for getting involved, kind of getting out of your your little mm-hmm. corner of the world and, yeah. and trying to learn. And I like the word you use, curious. And when I was talking with Steve May, who introduced us. He said that because you've been so involved in these different groups, you have this great sense of the profession and and what's going on. So is that what started to lead you to want to be more involved with AVMA or what kind of encouraged you like, "Mm, I might want to do a little bit more? Well, I think it's been a an evolution. You know, I, I think I've always wanted to be somebody that can make a difference, uh, whether it's again with an individual or with a group or for the profession as a whole. And and uh, yeah, I'm at, I'm at a point in my career where I recently retired from the the day job at the end of 2022, and I have still a lot of energy and a lot of passion about the profession and and the issues and the challenges that we face. And so, you know, I think uh, the AVMA is our parent organization. They represent us in many ways, and they do a great job of advocacy for not only the profession, but also society in general. And if I can participate in a way that's constructive, whether it's uh, setting the tone to have some dialogue on tough issues or actually I'm being elected president elect uh, this year and assuming a leadership role from within uh, you know I think I look forward to those um, opportunities and challenges because yes and speaking of, of having conversations it's not really an elephant in the room because I think we do talk about it <laughs> but there are definitely challenges in veterinary medicine and I know that one of those that you're quite passionate about is access to care. And that's that's a huge category, right? There's a lot of things that could be done to improve that. And going back to, you have a, a good sense of what's going on in the profession. I know that there's kind of shocking numbers when it comes to goals of individuals. We would like to be working in veterinary medicine. And I think, is it like, 5,000 veterinarians that will be short in a certain time period or something like that? Well, there's data to suggest that by 2030, we might be actually 15,000 short. Some some might argue that we're already 5,000 short, uh, (laughs) depending on the day in any given clinic. You know, access to care to me ranges from, you know, I believe that everybody that's a pet owner has right not it's not a privilege, but I think you know there's enough evidence out there to suggest the human animal bond is 
good for people's personal health and well-being. And and to me, it would seem like governmental programs that support people to at least have the basics of care for their pets would be something to advocate for both on a state and federal level. As an example, I think license portability and issues around exemptions for things like spay neuter to allow people to to go into a state and provide those services where we have great needs would be helpful. I think we don't have enough specialists. Um, Cardiologists are unicorns, as an example. You know, San Antonio is a city of 3 million people just south of where I live. They have no veterinary cardiologists in the neighborhood. Issues from the farm to the family, as I like to say, uh, you know, 500 counties and mainly rural areas that have no veterinary services, people having to drive across state to get the attention they need, whether it's for a companion animal or a, or a farm animal. There's plenty of challenges, and I think there are some solutions, whether it's issues around the controversial mid-level provider or more veterinary graduates or looking to the foreign veterinarians can pass the NAVLI. There are some short, intermediate, and long-term solutions, and we need to be looking at all of them simultaneously, in my opinion. Absolutely, because it's such a big challenge <laughs> that you're you're going to have to work in different capacities at different angles of the of the challenge to get the solution. So with, I have have such a huge heart for vet students as well. And I want people to be, and not just vet students, excuse me, for veterinary technician students, anybody who's interested in coming into this profession, I I welcome them and I I want to support them in, in all the, in the best ways, right? And so from your experience in academia, from your understanding of some challenges the whole profession has, what recommendations do you have for people who are either in the process, they're, they're in school, or they're looking to get into this profession? What would you recommend to them? Well, I, I think, first of all, it's a great profession. I mean, I think we, we focus a lot these days on the challenges, you know, suicide rates, mental well-being, lack of diversity. But, you know, point of the matter is we, we help people and and their animals on a daily basis, and we have a lot to celebrate. So I think it's a rewarding profession. I think certainly our technicians need to be better utilized. They need to be better recognized. They need to be better paid. I think there's some movement in in all those directions recently, which is encouraging. I think as a profession, we need to do a lot more outreach. And we need to to maybe focus on the positive messages. I, I think right now we, we're not our own best friend when it comes to encouraging people to come into the profession. You know, so I think community programs that reach into the the urban areas, continuing to build on the loan forgiveness programs, uh, encourage practices to pay for technician education, exchange for maybe service time afterwards or during. There's ways to do it that everybody benefits, in my opinion. Yes, I actually that it'll go out this Monday. So in just a few days, February 11th, 12th, something around there. But I interviewed the director of an online veterinary technician program. And she's just fantastic in general, Virginia. But she talked about the ability to be a a veterinary assistant, and then to be going through this online program at the same time. And so the clinic could help support these veterinary assistants to become, you know, licensed, registered, whichever (laughs) term is appropriate. And it does, it it encourages career growth and career pathing. It supports these individuals that are so crucial to working in clinic. So I I love hearing these types of stories where there there are lots of different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and something like that. I mean, the online 
approach while they're still in, in the clinic and working. I mean, that's something that needs to be utilized more widely than it currently is, I think, you know, both by independent hospital operators or certainly the corporate groups as well. Mm. And you actually said something that I don't think I've thought long enough about, and that is the requirements of these standardized tests and especially with international individuals. Because I Mm -hmm. remember I've met several veterinarians who got their veterinary degrees outside of the United States. And because that license didn't carry over or there were a lot of obstacles in the way, they worked as veterinary technicians, but they had training of veterinarians. So that could definitely be another thing to maybe have more discussions about how could we make that easier. That definitely would contribute to the diversity issue <laughs> in, yeah. in the profession as well. But yeah, that's a that's another good one that I, I have seen in my experience. Like I said, that I saw it Rose. from internship and yeah. Hi, we'll be back with the second half of the show after this quick break. But first, I wanted to take a moment and thank you for listening to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. If you're enjoying the show, the best way to support us is to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us to reach more listeners, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Oh, just back to international training and how can we better bridge the people who get training internationally to be able to to work and integrate into the United States system, I think is yep. another way to address several of the challenges you've already mentioned. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the main roadblock is, in addition to the NAVLI, is visas, you know, H-1B, mm-hmm. visa, and it's a quota of, you know, 30% per year or something. And, and so I think, you know, a lot of foreign veterinarians have food, animal, and poultry, and other expertise that could be tapped to help fill that void, as an example. And so, I, I think it's something that that we need to look at. And this is where, again, the AVMA and their advocacy on the federal level could could maybe make a difference for us. Uh, and it would be a potentially shorter ramp time than creating new vet schools. You know. <laughs> Because that takes a, a little bit of time to do that. Absolutely. Well, and going back to AVMA, I have brought someone on the podcast to talk a little bit about how veterinarians can be in government and just some of those roles. And I admit, I I don't know a whole lot of, about how, well, how government works in general, <laughs> but especially when it comes to veterinary medicine. So, I mean, you obviously believe in it enough to be to running for an office, but can you kind of share a little bit about how that works and your experience and, and how you feel like this might be a good way to really start to address some of the challenges that we are facing? Well, I think, you know, if you look at the federal veterinarians and the USDA, that's another pain point regard to meeting the needs, whether it's uh, food safety or other things. So I think those are career tracks where veterinarians can, I mean, it's another, we have so many options in our profession, but right now we don't have enough people to fill all the opportunities that are presented to us. And the Federal Veterinary Corps and USDA are struggling to meet the demands of their aspect of taking care of us, you know, and another example of where we need to put resources and time and effort towards meeting those challenges or or we're going to have potentially real issues with our food supply or other things down the road, you know? So, so there's veterinary so- shortages in those areas too. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Well, they're typically not, I mean, they have great benefits programs and, and great satisfaction, but they're not highly paid positions. So uh, they're sort mm-hmm. of like, Rural animal veterinary medicine, there's you know pay scale issue, but you know if we graduated more veterinarians or brought people in that had the qualifications that would then the percentages naturally fill some of those roles. You know, I mean, even if we don't 
you know, 6% of 8,000 veterinarians graduating a year is a bigger number than 6% of 4,000 going into whatever part of the profession that might be equine or food animal or federal veterinarians, you know? Yeah. So you're bringing up several things that I haven't really thought about as well. So what do you think are some of these opportunities or conversations that we need to have that you don't think we're talking about enough or that maybe a a lot of people don't know about? From a a workforce issue or some other aspects or what? Anything. Um, I mean, I don't know what I don't know, right? So (laughs) what should people know? Well, I think, you know, there are tough conversations happening, but there's also not a lot of awareness. I think, uh, you know, the, the AVMA tries to do a good job of communicating, but Here's an example of where I've been getting an education the last couple of weeks on the issues of uh, depopulation of uh, poultry and and pigs with, with regard to disease control and eradication. There's some really tough issues to be dealt with there with regard to efficiency versus animal suffering. You know, it's kind of the best, what's the best of the worst choice. Mm. And there's some some things that we probably need to look at a little harder uh, with regard to some of the practices in that regard. So that there's, I think, issues all around us that as a profession, we need to be engaged and, and aware and people need to be willing to enter a dialogue where there are dissenting voices. And, and generally, in my experience, the, the best solutions come from everybody being at the table together, you know. I think we're missing a little bit of that in some of these discussions. Hmm. Yes, I went to the Veterinary Innovation Summit back in, oh goodness, was that September? And it was my second year to go and we have great conversations. But I kind of felt the same thing that you're saying is one of the two big topics there were veterinary technicians and having uh, different levels and and options for veterinary technician utilization, as well as education when it comes to veterinary medicine in general. And the people that I did not see on these panels were veterinary technicians, no deans. (laughs) I'm like, wait wait a minute, the people who actually make the changes or, or have impact in these areas, where are they? So we can hear their perspectives because whether it's pushback, that's fine. I, you know, just to understand the different perspectives so that we can start implementing things to, to keep moving forward. So did you go to the recent conference? I'm going to blink on the name of it. That, that is uh, sponsored by AVMA. It's a leadership. The Veterinary Leadership Conference in Chicago earlier. Yeah. In- yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I so, was there. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard great things about it. I, I spoke with Gary Marshall, Dr. Gary Marshall, who had just come back from that. He said great things. I know the the two co-hosts that are on My Veterinary Life, they they talk about it quite a bit. They've had several people on their podcast to talk about it. Did you take away a few things from from that particular event? Yeah, I think it's a great event. I mean, I think it's, you know, an opportunity for networking and an opportunity for personal growth. Again, my role there was as a candidate. So I spent most of my time with the House of Delegates and the the business aspect that was alongside the the leadership conference itself. So I don't think I got the full benefit of the program that others did. But I echo what you said is that uh, historically, and again, this year, it's been a great uh, opportunity for people to to develop as leaders. And, and, you know, hopefully they'll put that to work in their communities or their local VMAs or, or whatever, you know, so. Yeah. We had to pause right here because Phoebe the pug needed a little of attention, but it was a great time to start talking about all the different pets and animals at Dr. Bob's house. So just wait. Well, I think this is a good opportunity, though, because when I was looking at your website, you have a picture of all of your dogs. You have quite a few. 
So <laughs> do you want to share any stories about your personal pets? Well, I think at last count, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, it's called the Two Hearts Ranch, Dos Corazones Ranch here in uh, Wimberley, Texas. And I think at last count, we have 31 pets of various sizes, shapes, and species. So we're, uh, we're collectors. We could even be termed, we could even be termed hoarders perhaps by some, you know, so we have to be a little bit careful, but we love them all. They all have special stories attached to them for sure. <laughs> That's why you moved out there in Texas. You needed more space. <laughs> that was a big, big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and I mean, well, the first, you know, when we moved here, the first thing that got a look see was the barn, not the house, you know. So if the <laughs> barn barn measured up, then then we'd look at the house. So Yeah. Now with Dr. Jill's background in, in horses, I'm guessing you have at least a couple of horses, is that correct? I think we have ten. <laughs> nice, a good round, percent. nice round number. Yeah. Yes. Well, people love stories. So do you want to share one about the, the pug uh, since that was the one who wanted to be part of the podcast? <laughs> yeah, Phoebe is, uh, she's like 15 years old right now. And she's, she's, she rules the roost. So we have a German shepherd who is afraid of her and uh, everybody <laughs> else backs away when she, when she comes through. So it's interesting how the smallest is, is uh, She's been through a lot. She was a, a, a husband of one of my technicians in Southern California at the time. And so she knew we liked pugs. And she said, would you like to have a pug? And as I was walking by the surgery desk and I said, sure. So Phoebe came to the, after being a, a backyard breeder in Brea, California. So she's hey. uh, had a pretty good life the past 10 years. The first four were a little tough, but. She's doing all right now. <laughs> Sounds like she can hold her own. So, <laughs> yeah, she, you know, she started as a street dog, so she, she takes no prisoners, you know. So, oh, <laughs> uh, and you've moved quite a bit. So, I mean, you've been from California to, you know, more north, east, Midwest. Uh, you've been all over. So, is do you like to travel as well? I actually like to stay at home as much as I can, but tra travel is fun. Yeah. And I think, you know, it also gives me a perspective. I mean, I've seen a lot of the different geography and a lot of the, met a lot of people and in, in a lot of different aspects of our, our profession. So I think the moves have been, been helpful to me again, as a, in a growth perspective with regard to both personal and professional opportunities, you know? Absolutely. So I think especially when you go into internships and residencies, you tend to move around, which I have done myself. And my husband and I recently moved this past summer to Savannah, Georgia from St. Louis, Missouri. It was a remind it was a very humbling experience, shall I say. Well, before we run out of time and, and we do our final four questions, is there anything that you want to make sure that we we share with the profession, anything that you would would want to say to everyone? No, I think we've covered a lot of bases here, Megan, and I've, I think I've had the opportunity to, to share quite a bit. So thanks for uh, having me on and, and I'm ready for the big four anytime, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Well, you're very humble, so you have a lot of, of mission and drive, and you want to give back. So thank you. A lot of the, the volunteer work that you talked about, these organizations, committees, they are not only are they volunteer work, but they're often unrecognized. So thank you for all the work that you've done in giving back to the profession and you're continuing to wanting, want to do. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, you, you might want to hold that thanks because I'm about to do the, the hard four questions on you. But um, <laughs> the first question is, what is something that people may get wrong about you? Well, I, I think sometimes my 
very passionate, you know, and so if I seem enthusiastic about things uh, and I can also maybe interrupt people and so they may think that I'm I'm really sort sort of an not the sort of nice humble guy that you just mentioned that I maybe too black and white or too in their face so I, I sometimes people that don't know me might see that side and and not really uh, recognize that the the passion that underneath the passion or the or what appears to be a strong response is actually a, a sort of a a people oriented person you know so oh that's a good one the the second question is what is a hidden skill or interest that you have well uh you know the the pandemic made me into a a chef so i'm love to work in the kitchen i find it to be a nice release and a creative opportunity it's helped give me a different skill set i didn't recognize that i had so. <laughs> what is your favorite meal that you that you make well i am in texas so you know i had to get a smokers pretty good these days brisket chicken and other things on the on the smokers i have to come over and give it a try sometime Nice. Yes. My husband would love that. He is like a carnivore. So <laughs> we have grills, smokers, all sorts of things. Yeah. Nice. The third question is what is something on your bucket list? We brought it up a little earlier. I think travel, you know, I, I haven't been to a lot of the places in the world I'd like to visit. Haven't experienced the cultures and the peoples. I've had the opportunity to go to Europe, but I haven't been to Asia. I haven't been to Australia. I haven't been to Africa. So I, I think uh, probably in, in the time remaining, I'd like to cover a little bit more of the globe and experience the world around us, the beautiful people and places for myself, you know, so oh, and, absolutely. Bring, and bring Jill along, of course. You know, so. <laughs> yes, of course. And finally, what is something you're most grateful for? Yeah, I, I think a lot. I mean, from from my parents to my profession, I guess. Uh, the, you know, I've been blessed with a lot of opportunities and a, and a lot of uh, reward. And so I'm just grateful for everybody that, that's touched me and, and made me who I am today. And I, I look forward to trying to pay that forward with gratitude to individuals. And, and organizations going forward because I've received so much from others. I try to live in gratitude on a daily basis for that reason. Hmm. I'll give you a bonus question since you mentioned it. It sounds like there have been multiple people that have really helped you in your profession and life in general. Is there one in particular that you would like to highlight? Uh, that's a hard choice. Uh, I'll, I'll pick one. So he's he's no longer with us. The Frank Lowe was the dean at Tufts University when I was a faculty member there. And, and he and I had a lot of conversations and he was a great mentor to me from a standpoint of helping me develop, you know, into a leader and, and was always a, a good sounding board and somebody that would be empathetic and sympathetic when when needed. So it was I still think about him on a regular basis and uh, the lessons that he helped me learn. Thank you for joining us. You are why I continue to put out episodes with amazing guests like Dr. Bob. And if you are like me, you thought, hmm, who is this amazing Dr. Jill Clark that married Dr. Bob? Well, I went and asked her to join me for an episode too, and that will be next week, a story of movies to medicine. Vet med was a second career for Dr. Jill, and she is amazing. Dr. Bob was right. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast here, and if you could also go subscribe over on YouTube. I'm learning more and more about video and hope to continue to bring even more fun and informative content to you over there. Until next time.